do. Uh, I'm the zoological director of the Centre for 14 Theology, and I'm a professional cryptozoologist, so uh, anomalous big cats are just one part of uh, my whole interest. I'm interested in uh, undiscovered species of animal or anomalous animals of all kinds worldwide. And I've been lucky enough to go on a number of expeditions around the world looking for different creatures. What I'm going to do today is give you a bit of a whistle stop tour of the world, looking at uh, different kinds of mystery cats on different parts of the world. It's in no way exhaustive. Uh, I've just chosen one or two of the most interesting from several different continents, just to give you a flavour of uh, mystery cats or cat like creatures that are reported from different cultures around the world, some of which I've investigated, some of which I haven't. We'll start off in Asia, uh, for no other reason than it's my favourite continent and I've done most of my work in Asia. Uh, in 2003 and again in 2004, I took part in expeditions to Western Sumatra, uh, to a place called Gunung Tuju, the Lake of Seven Peaks, ostensibly to search for a creature called the Orang Pendek which in Indonesia means the short man. It's an upright walking ape, a roughly five feet tall, very powerful adult, covered with long dark hair, a red mane of hair down the back, uh, possibly related to the orangutan. That's why we're there looking for that. But uh, I found out wherever I go, I find out more information about other creatures in the same area. And uh, Sumatra was no exception. Uh, while we're in Sumatra, we also heard about this creature called the Chigao. Now, uh, the Chigao is an undiscovered species of cat that is supposed to lurk in the jungles of Western Sumatra. It's described as being larger than a leopard, but smaller than a tiger. It has a very short, stumpy tail, somewhat like a lynx or a bobcat. It has front limbs that are longer than its back limbs, which lends the animal sort of sloping appearance, more like a hyena in its outline. It's supposed to have a mane, though not as large as that of a lion, so maybe more of a rough about the neck, long hair. And most interestingly, uh, canine teeth that protrude down past the bottom jaw are highly visible. The Chigao is also said to be highly aggressive. And when a Chigao appears in the area, there is what is called a Chigao panic. And uh, all of the villagers absolutely go bananas and board up their windows and want to go back after dark. Our guide uh, in the area was a man called Sahar. And he told us that his father, who's now dead, had one of his friends killed by a Chigao in the 1960s. This uh, area of Sumatra, Karuchi, uh, produces uh, an awful lot of tea and they were on a trade route carrying tea to trade for rice and they stopped one night in clearing they all camped out in the middle of the night a chigao came out of the forest grabbed the man lying next to Sahar's father and hauled him off into the jungle and his friends said they heard him screaming search for him when they found him he had been disemboweled um, Sahar's father said he brought it on himself because earlier in the evening when they were cooking rice to eat, he was eating rice directly from the pot, which is a great faux pas in uh, the culture of the local people. You're supposed to wait for the rice to be handed out and eat it from your own bowl. To eat it from the main bowl is what it's all tantamount to spitting in it. And they do have this belief that nature takes revenge against uh, Human misdemeanors, we were told when we were in the jungle, never go naked in the jungle. There's, there's a lake that we bathe in. He was never bathe naked or go naked in the jungle because it enrages the tiger. And uh, the tiger will punish you for it. The particular tribe that we were with, our, our, um, our guide, <coughs> their spirit animal, or Nanak, as they call it, uh, is the tiger. And I believe in were tigers or chindaku, as they call them. And it's not like our belief in uh, a lion throat as a man who sprouts fangs and claws and hair and falls on all fours like one chain. Uh, it's, it's something much more subtle. They believe that 
they call down the spirit of the tiger. They believe that the, the man who was the prognator of their tribe lived until he was uh, uh, 500 years old, wandered off into the jungle and became a spirit tiger. And they can bring down the spirit of the tiger by going into a trance. They also believe that occasionally you will be born with some sort of psychic marker on you that angers real life tigers. If you go to the jungle, the tiger will go berserk and come after you. And the only way to get rid of this marker is to have it bitten out by a wet tiger or a chimney. And our guy, if you saw him, he looks like an accountant. He's a little guy about yay big, with great big sort of um, milk bottle glasses and book teeth. You wouldn't think there was anything to him, but he was a chimney who could bring down the spirit of the tiger. And uh, there's a Western woman who is over there, a scientist called Debbie Marta, who's the head of the tiger conservation uh, group in Indonesia, who's actually seen our own pen deck on four separate occasions. She said um, they don't usually let outsiders see the ritual, but she's seen it, and she's seen our little guy get possessed by the spirit of the tiger and go for Zerk and sink his teeth into the, uh, the flesh of his own brother. But I digress a little. Uh, she also said more about the, the, uh, the Chigao. They're associated with water. They live in and around water. And her story was that a Chigao had its lair uh, by a river where there was a fallen tree that people used the tree as a bridge to get off over this small river. A lot of them slipped, fell into the river, and the Chigao would come and grab them. A couple of interesting things. Where we were in Sumatra, it's a uh, very cool rainforest, it's very high. It's in the mountains, so it's quite cold, and it's a freezing cold at night, far too cold for crocodiles. So you could have a big cat that lived in and around water without fear of it get, getting eaten by a crocodile. So there could be something there. Uh, after I came back, I gave this description of the Chigao to Darren, Darren actually, a paleontologist who uh, said that it sounded rather like a homothere or scimitar cat. We've mm -hmm. all heard of the saber-toothed cat, uh, often misnamed saber-toothed tiger. Scimitar cats were related. And fossils of uh, homotheres have been found on the neighboring island of Java, only 10,000 years old. Now, 10,000 years is the blink of an eye in geological times yesterday. So it's not too much of a push to postulate there might be a scimitar cat surviving in the jungles of Sumatra and this is the creature behind the legend of the Chigao. Whatever it is, they're very afraid of it, much more than they are of tigers. Much more than they are of any other one in the jungle. Whilst we were there, I found a large golden coloured hair. I brought it back and sent it off for analysis to the University of Copenhagen. Came back and it's from a golden cat, not from a Chigao. But the golden cat is not a very great creature, and it was uh, nice to find some hair from one, but the Chigao itself remains elusive. Moving on elsewhere in Asia, there's a little speck of an island in uh, the southernmost archipelago of the uh, Ryukyu Islands in Japan. It's called Iremoti. It's a tiny little place. I think it's something like 20 miles across, 20, 25 miles across, a little dot in the ocean. And until recently, hardly any people lived there. Uh, in 1965, a brand new species of wild cat was discovered there. And it's called the Emoji cat. And it turned out to be the most primitive of all the living cats. And an amazing discovery on this tiny, tiny little island. A predator unknown to science. And this lingered as recently as 1965 before being discovered. And now it's reckoned that down to only 150 individuals because recently some idiots uh, built a road across the island and a lot of them are getting knocked over and knocked down. Um, the local name for it is Pingy Maya, this cat, and it's believed to prey upon uh, all sorts of things, a species of tiny little hog that lives there as well, which is the second smallest pig in the world. But they talk about another cat. They call it Yamamaya, and this is much bigger. They say it's about the size of a collie dog, and it's patterned like a tiger, but nobody knows exactly what this is. No one, no Westerner certainly has ever seen it, but the natives insist that this thing is living out there in the jungle. 
your theory is that it's a type of cloudy leopard. A cloudy leopard is uh, one of the most incredible cats. It's probably my favourite wall cat. One of the most cryptic. Uh, you might be aware that recently uh, the Bonaean subspecies is now, now to a four of a separate species and separated from the other. The other uh, I'm trying to get to this point. Do I need to press it twice? Yeah. Push it once and then again. Push, push it straight off, straight off. Push, now push it again. And again. That's it. The, the Bonaean um, cloudy leopard is now part of a completely separate species. There were a number of uh, cloudy leopards in the islands. Uh, the one on Taiwan was thought to be extinct now. The last one was a sub adult caught in a hunter's trap in the mid 1980s, but there's a hope that in the jungles of Taiwan they're still hanging on. So, this strange creature. On this tiny little island, not just be an undiscovered species of cloudy leopard. So, if something like that can exist on an island 25 miles across, what else is looking out there in the wilds of the world? Moving off to Africa and something that sounds like a, a script for a horror film. Uh, in Tanzania, there's a belief. And this monstrous beast called the Mingua. And according to legend, the Mingua is a, a huge cat, the size of a lion, but sort of dappled and tabby like in colour and highly aggressive. Legends go that a long time ago uh, a chief, a tribal chief, brought a little cat into the village to keep as a pet, and his witch doctor warned him that's not a normal cat, that's a Mingua, I'll get rid of him, and he didn't believe him. And the cat ate all his chickens and got a bit bigger, and they ate all his goats and got a bit bigger, and they ate all his pigs and got a bit bigger, and they ate all his cows and got a bit bigger, until it became this monstrous beast of the Mingua. And uh, it went on the rampage, and the local hero had to go and slay it. And the hero went out and slew a monkey and brought it back to his mother and said, Is this the Mingua? And she said, No, that's not the Mingua. He goes back and slays an antelope, brings it back, is this the Mingua? No, it's not the Mingua. It goes and kills a zebra. Until finally, he goes to all the animals until he finally gets in the Mingua and, and kills it. There's a belief very similar to this in Japan, something called Beki, uh, Bekinoko. They believe that if a cat grows to 13 years old, its tail will fork on this and it will become this creature, the Bekinoko, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more aggressive and gets all kinds of strange supernatural. Uh, Powers. The most famous story being the vampire cat of Nebushima, which disguised itself as a corpse quarters out of a law and was supposed to have been drinking blood every night, many evil kind. And what quite where these strange beliefs spring from, um, I don't know. But that, that's the mythology of the Mingua. How about the biology of the Mingua? Now if you if you just heard that, you'd think it was just another piece of tribal folklore. These stories exploded in 1922 in a uh, small coastal village in Tanzania called Lindy. There was a guy here called Captain W. Hitchens, a native magistrate, and he recorded the goings on at the time. Uh, they had a marketplace in this village, and people would leave their wares in the marketplace and come and sell them the next day. And they would appoint a guard to look over them. Uh, and the guy was called uh, uh, Scary. And it was his job to make sure no one came along and seized any of the wares that were going to sell the next day. And people turned up one morning and he was Scary, the guard wasn't there. And there was a search for him and he was later found underneath one of the stalls and he'd been torn to pieces, absolutely ripped to shreds. And in his hand, he was clutching some grey hair quite a lot of a lion or a leopard. And two men came forward and said that they had seen a huge brindled grey cat attacking him last night, but they were too scared to help them things tearing to pieces. So Hitchens took two armed guards and he stayed overnight, nothing came. He stayed the next night, nothing came. The third night he thought the animal had moved on. They got a new guard. And uh, 
showed up using that ball to prove more and he was dead, torn to pieces. And the killings went on for several weeks up and down the coast in several of these little villages and the creature was never called to them. As soon as they started, they stopped. Then again, in the 1930s, in another village, Hitchens recorded the same thing when Mingwa came back again. And uh, he said he saw a body of a man who had been brought to him on a stretcher who had been absolutely ripped to pieces. And a local hunter looked at him and said that these are not the bite and claw marks of either a leopard or a lion. This is a Mingwa, something totally, completely different. Excuse me, it's going to be um, a misunderstood with the, the hyena. There's also sort of a myth of a hyena killing in Tanzania, in Kenya. I forgot the name, you know, this very like a, a, a hyena from the past. The Nandi bear? Yes, the Nandi bear, that's right. The Nandi bear, yeah. So this is different. So it's different from oh, the Nandi bear, yeah. The Nandi bear has no long tail, it's, it's shaped like a bear, it's a bit sort of powerful thing, it goes on the floor with a bear like the snout. Whereas as the Mingwa is an immense cat. Mm -hmm. Um, another Westerner, Patrick Bowen, uh, saw the tracks of a mingwa that was supposed to have forced its way into a, a kraal, which is like a, um, a thorny fence that's erected around where you keep livestock or where people sleep to stop animals getting in and taking them. Um, he said it forced its way in, grabbed the native child and carried them off. He said its footprints looked like a leopard's. But they were the size of the lions and tangled up in a form of a crawl where the sin forced its way through. Were some grey hairs. Now, sadly, this is all in the 1920s and 1930s. None of this was saved, so we can't analyse it. As far as I know, there's never been another one report since, or if they have, uh, they've not reached the West, which means either the creature is extinct or it was a rarely occurring mutation of known species. One theory is that the Mingwa legends are based on a, a melanotic leopard, not a melanistic, we all know what melanistic leopard is, black panther. Um, melanotic, rather than being black, it gives it a sort of strange brindle effect, almost like a, a domestic tabby cat. But that wouldn't explain the size of this creature. Uh, there are a few melanotic leopards stuffed uh, in museums under the same size as all grey leopards. But uh, people who have seen them in what I say is the size of mine, so exactly what it is remains a mystery. And it might even be extinct now, but like I say, there's been no talk of them since the 1930s. South America, I was in South America. Uh, Last, last November with uh, Paul here in the way, Paul and Lisa there in the back. To make it back. Uh, once again, we were not looking really for big cats. We got over there mainly to look for the giant cat Honda. But once we got there, we found that Guiana is a complete menagerie of strange creatures. As well as giant Anaconda reports, we heard talk of something called the Dai which is an immense hairy hornet similar to perhaps not to big four Sasquatch in North America. We heard reports of a race of undiscovered pygmies who simply paint their faces red and are obsessed with stealing uh, tobacco from people. These are the same stories we heard all over the country from North to West. Uh, we had sightings of what might be a new species of very small caiman. More importantly for this conference, we heard stories of a creature called the Water Tiger. A Water Tiger is a name widely used across the whole of South America, and it probably refers to different things in different areas. For instance, in uh, Patagonia, the Water Tiger seems to be uh, confused with the otter, the giant otter, and the more standard sized otter. Confused. But before I got over to Guyana, I thought the stories of the, the uh, water tiger in Guyana would prove to be nothing more than the giant otter. And the giant otter is a formidable beast. 
it grows to seven feet long. It's an immense creature. Along with the wolverine, it's the biggest of all the mustelids. So if you can imagine an otter whose head stretched from here, and its tail would be to the wall, you've got a very big, formidable creature. They don't usually attack human beings, but they've got one hell of a lot of Could this be the water tiger? Well, I was for a big surprise when we actually talked to witnesses. They were adamant that the water tiger was not one of the same as the giant otter. At a remote place called Point Ranch, we talked to a gentleman called Elmo, who had seen these things, and he said they come in several different colours. They can be plain brown, like puma, they can be spotted by the jaguar, or they can be white with black spots, almost like a Dalmatian dog. He said that unlike, uh, unlike the otter, they can be quite aggressive and they'll hunt in packs. There'll be a uh, what they call a master, an adult that will send along all the babies in front of it, all the cubs, to flush out prey. He said they don't live entirely in water, but they're amphibious, they live around water and they hunt in water. Uh, another man named Joseph claimed to have seen back in the 1970s the skin of one of these things that had been killed by a hunter. And he described it as being 10 feet long, it included the tail, white with black spots, and with a head like a tiger. And by a tiger, he meant an actual Asian tiger, because there is some confusion in a lot of South America. Uh, the jaguar is referred to as a tiger, mainly due to uh, Western colonials calling a tiger. Over here. For instance, in Belize, the jaguar is called a tiger and the spider is used called a baboon because a lot of the people who came over there, like the Westerners, have been to Africa and Asia and just right ignorantly applied these totally incorrect names to the local fauna. They said the head was white, to an Asian tiger. Uh, <coughs> there was another man uh, called Ernesto, who was an ex chief. Who said that his youth, he and his grandfather had been on boat when it had been attacked by a water tiger. Something grabbed the bottom of the boat and shook it violently. He didn't actually see whatever it was. His grandfather said it was a water tiger and had hang on to some branches to stop themselves falling in the water while this thing shook the boat. He didn't actually see it, it could have been a big cane. In that instance, but his grandfather told him to say, I will tie you. Another man called Joseph, in a village called Akuri, said that uh, his father said, uh, told him that in the area where the village is, when they were building the village many years ago, they used a little water tiger, uh, a water tiger in, in the area and it lived in a hole in the back of the river. He said it was brown and highly dangerous and shouldn't be approached, but that was many, many years ago. So people still claim to have seen the water tiger uh, fairly recently. Um, um, Elmo's site wasn't that long ago, it was of a, a whole group of them. Uh, and in the mountain range where we were, there were supposed to be a whole packs of them living in the mountains, although we didn't see them. So what the hell is the water tiger? It's certainly not a giant hunter. The different coloured fur is very interesting. It could be that this isn't a cat at all, but it's some other kind of huge muscle. The stoat will turn white in winter, it'll have a white winter coat. Now, there are several mustelids, the badger, the badger otter, um, pine martin group of animals. There are several in this group that exhibit different colours. So it could be not a cat at all, but a big, powerful, elongated mustelid of some kind. And there was a huge prehistoric mustard, is it? What's it called? A damn giant prehistoric mustard? Megalitus. 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 They were the big ones in Africa as well. Yeah, there's about the size of a leopard. So imagine a member of the weasel stoat, badger family, imagine a stoat the size of a leopard. An um, active hunter as well. Maybe it's something like that. We're not the short of it, we don't know. But we want to get back out there and uh, go and look for it again together with the giant animal. Bayama is so poorly explored, it's like a wonderland of strange creatures. Can I see one of the questions? The Margay, 
is it the ocelot? Eh? Or is it it's a separate species? It's like a small uh, cat. The barbie and the ocelot. Yes, is it the same one? No, the barbie and the ocelot are two different things. I see. They're two different cats. So they're both of them are way too small to be a wolf tiger. The wolf tigers are a hefty big creature. I got the feeling from, they never explicitly said it, but they seemed to imply that it was long rather than tall. It seems to be it's something in the way they're describing it, maybe like something very long and sleek, but low slump rather than something tall. Yeah, but much bigger. Much bigger. And once again, there they seem to be more aggressive than the known species of cat. Could it be linked to the gender of another species or subspecies? It would be something from known to size. It'd have to be a giant jaguar, I mean. Yeah. And it seems so different, it would probably be a different species altogether. Although it might be related. <coughs> Australia, not a place you'd uh, think of finding cats or cat like creatures. But there is a, a creature from Australian Aboriginal law, law that's very cat like called the Yari, which is supposed to be, it looks like a, a ferocious, uh, spotted or striped cat like animal. And when the uh, first Westerners started to go to Australia, uh, in 1705, the, the Dutch East India Company reported that there were tigers in Australia. Where there should be no tigers. In 1871, the uh, Proceedings for the Zoological Society of London wrote about a 13 year old son of a local magistrate, uh, Brinsley Sheridan, who was walking his dog in Queensland when he encountered what he describes as a cat like creature with tufted ears like a lynx, a long tail with bands around it. The size of a full grown finger and it attacked his dog, he shot at it, it ran from the tree, and it came tearing down the tree again, hissing and spitting, slashing with its teeth and claws, and he thought uh, better on it and ran away. There were lots of reports of a cat like creature in Queensland and in North Australia. Uh, in 1909, a creature uh, was seen by two men. Who were out checking their livestock and just killed a calf because it was a female calf and they described it once again as having these limbs like tufted ears, white underbelly, sort of greyish bands across it, uh, about the size of a leopard, and it sort of snarled at them fiercely, beat the ground with its tail, and they once again decided this question was about the back part of fowl and um, beat the house through the tree. You'll find that. In the 1900s, and what was the sort of the First World War? There were lots of reports of people having actually shot these things, these cat like animals, as they say, about the size, between the size of a uh, salary leopard and uh, an ordinary leopard. And a lot of them were shot because they were getting into chicken coops, and it seemed no more unusual than people shooting foxes in Britain. There are many, many stories of people seeing these things uh, and shooting them, but tragically, you know, one had. Save hide or bone of any of them because they didn't think they were important or just throw it away. And the Aborigines used to describe it as they'd say, Oh, in a walk, all white like fella pussy, but in all big white like fella dinga. So there's some sort of large cat or cat like creature. Uh, an ex girlfriend of mine said that her late husband had uh, been on a branch in uh, Queensland in the 1960s. And he's there with uh, an Aboriginal friend of his who had a brilliant name of uh, Wombat. And, and they had worked in services together. He had quite an unusual life, this guy. He ended up um, being a sort of safety inspector on uh, North, North Sea oil rigs. But he worked with animals uh, a lot when he was in the days in services. And uh, they were out with their dogs. And sort of dogs all froze. And I looked at something. And as an animal, coming through the bush towards them. And his description was of, once again, a creature with lynx-like ears and bandy fur, and this time sort of rusty fur, rather than grey or white, but bandy sort of rusty fur. And it was very cat-like, but 
without any like tax symbol or letter or jugular or title or law or anything like that. So the dog started barking and the creature turned and ran. Unfortunately, sightings started to drop off after the Second World War and they got less and less and less uh, in the decades afterwards and uh, now there are virtually no sightings of this creature whatsoever. Uh, it's a possibility that they're now extinct, possibly due to the introduction of the cane toad and these things eating cane toads and being poisoned. But what was the loss of this, this creature? It's been given the name of the Queensland tiger, not to be confused with the Tasmanian tiger, or also known as the Tasmanian wolf or fireside, which is the only t shirt with one. Is anyone I don't know? At least there at the back. You stand up. That animal there at the back, that is the logo of the Centre for Fourteen Zoology, it's the fire sign, Tasmanian wolf, Tasmanian tiger, marsupial wolf. That's something completely different. Not the same as the Queensland tiger. That creature looks like a striped wolf or a striped dog. The Queensland tiger looks like a striped cat. There could be some relationship. That's it, that would be one Now, as you all know, or should know that, uh, Apart from a few species of rogue bat and things that have been introduced by human beings, Australia is a land of monotremes and marsupials. Monotremes being anyway, I don't want to be a big one, just be a kid there. And marsupials being um, creatures that are made in the pouches, and are really going to be the obvious ones. But there's an awful lot of uh, animals living in Australia that look very like animals living elsewhere in the world, but are not closely related. It's called convergent evolution, where two animals that are not closely related at all evolve to look like each other because they're fulfilling similar roles and similar ecological issues, often on separate sides of the world. So we've got uh, a wonderful thing called the marsupial mole, which is a tiny little lion marsupial that digs under the earth and feeds on worms, one of the freakiest animals in the world. It's got this strange sort of plated nose that pushes the earth out of the way with. Not at all related to the placental moles we get over here. It looks like it looks it's doing the same thing. The third sign was, uh, was, and probably is, to be honest, uh, convergent with uh, wolves and dogs. Um, so, lived on mainland Australia and on Tasmania, and also once lived on New Guinea. Uh, Mainstream scientists would have you think it became extinct around about 2,000 years ago on mainland in Australia due to competition and possibly diseases transmitted by the dingo. Uh, not straight fires, the fire sign had one of the most powerful bombs of any animal. You've got a dingo and a fire sign face to face, it would be a fight to be a massacre of the dingo. The, the fire sign destroyed the dingo. The dingo degreed faster and it may have transmitted diseases. It was thought that they died out, forest line died out on mainland Australia about 2,000 years ago, but lingered on the island of Tasmania, where the dingo was never introduced, and was finally put into extinction by white settlers in the mid-1930s. It's almost certain the forest line is still around, both on Tasmania and on mainland Australia, and also in New Guinea. There's been some very convincing filming of fire signs. There's been some excellent witnesses, including some just from the park rangers. And the whole question of the fire signs has become mixed up with the Queensland tiger, which is different. They're both striped mystery animals from Australia. But the, uh, the fire sign is mainly seen in Tasmania, uh, Victoria, the southern areas of uh, Australia, although there are reports up in the Northern Territories as well. And also it was from New Guinea. This thing from the Queensland Tiger is totally different. It has the round face, not the long snout. It has long pointy ears, and it's very well worn. It climbs around in trees. So could it be another kind of marsupial? Uh, indeed, there were uh, a number of books that completely accepted this happening. Uh, the Wild Animals of Australasia by Albert Sherborne, Albert Sherborne Le Souf, 1926. He actually describes this thing alongside every other animal in Australia. Uh, and he described it as a, being about the size of a cloudy leopard, uh, cat like, tufted ears, long tail, and it's generally accepted. But as time went on, these things started to disappear, and nobody had a type of specimen. It's become primitive. So, in all likelihood, 
it's some sort of carnivorous marsupial that's converging to the cat. Now, there were what is often called marsupial cats, um, marsupial, the marsupial leopard being made the most famous, uh, Phycalea, and it's often likened to a, uh, a leopard. And early reconstruction say had it looking very cat like, but newer reconstructions have shown it to be more like a, a, a monstrous psychopathic possum. It didn't really look much like a cat at all. It has this amazing dentition, whereas cats have uh, large canine teeth dislocate the neck vertebrae of their prey. This thing, Phylacalia, the marsupial, the marsupial lion or marsupial leopard, had a next sort of um, guillotine like incisors for shearing great chunks of his prey. They were acting like bolt cutters. And it seems that how this animal hunted was to grab a hold of its prey with its claw and just chomp into it with these monstrous bolt cutter type uh, teeth. Now, no description of the Queensland tiger has ever been anything like that. If you saw a Phylacalia today, you would obviously notice these great sort of vicious book teeth. And it will probably not look much like a cat at all. So whatever the Queensland Tiger is or was, I don't think it was uh, Phylacalia or any of its relatives. Is it extinct? There have been no recent sightings like the Mingua, it seems to have faded away. The fire sign is still reported every year. There are dozens of fire signs every year. The Queensland Tiger may have bitten the dust, possibly due to the cane toad, possibly due to human interference, possibly due to it being shot so much in the early pioneer days, but it's just a shame that not one of those carcasses, not one claw, not one tooth, not one hair, not one piece of bone has ever saved, they were just generally fed to pigs or left to rot. So the mystery of the Queensland Tiger is likely to remain in the street forever, unless somewhere there's a holy grail in some forgotten museum basement or someone's attic. There's a skull from the east and just likely to be found. Now I could go on and on and on with other mystery cats or crap like creatures, but I've been here all day, so I'm just a little bit of a taster. Has anybody got any questions? Um, regarding Phylacalia, didn't they find some sub-fossil remains last year in a cave? Something. I found, um, you know, something of the order of a thousand years old or less. They found phylocyte remains that were thought to be very, very young. Mm -hmm. And it was one of these well, sinkholes, it was all now been preserved. That was a phylocyte, not one of the And there's some anecdotal evidence that the phylocyte was still knocking around on mainland mm -hmm. in Australia until 200 years ago. And it's supposed to have died out mm -hmm. 2000 years ago. In all probability, it's still there. Yeah, but um, they think they think they might be in reintroduction from Tasmania. I think they were there all the time. Yeah. They're ever made extinct. They're <laughs> elusive and red. Anybody else? You haven't uh, mentioned anything about uh, pumas or uh, their cats out in Australia. I understood that uh, they have been them for. Oh, absolutely. Uh, at, the, at least as many as there are over here. I, mean, I know people that have seen both Puma and Mocha and Panther uh, in the Australian bush. And in all likelihood, it's the same situation they've got over there that we've got here. But, um, you know, I couldn't cover everything because we'd be here all day, so I tried to go for the slightly more exotic ones. So I concentrated on what might have been the marsupial big cat rather than the percentile one. Yeah, there's, there's been some pretty good photographs taken in Australia. And, um, like I say, uh, I'm in touch with people who've seen Nobody knows because we've only got its fossil bones, we haven't got anything to explore. 
so we don't know. Um, I think there are some Aboriginal paintings of what might be from in the Turkish style clear. And they, they, if I remember, have sort of a sort of horizontal banding sign. But it's hard when you're, you're looking at Aboriginal artwork because they tend to draw the internal organs as well on a creature. If they draw it, they'll draw its heart and lungs inside it like you've got X-ray vision. So it's hard to interpret what it looks like. Yeah, what are your thoughts on these white lion and rose? I think they're liable to be a, um, rather than an individual species, they're liable to be sort of odd individuals of, of the African lion. You, you get strange markings or sort of strange hair to have no animals. What, what's the main street view in Australia? Well, they're getting, like over here, they're sort of they're steadily getting more to accept because they have been seen by top person officials as well. So it's sort of getting more credibility. And I like all of the things that we're studying, the big cats, in a way, the most the unknown big cats, or well, big cats in places where they shouldn't be, are probably the most acceptable and almost the most mundane because they're just about <coughs> living somewhere that shouldn't, that's been released. And these are, these are the descendants of it. It's not like a creature completely unknown to science or something brand new. It's, you know, it's not as controversial as something like a Yeti, or it's not as controversial as something like even fire science so far. Like I say, it's a known real species. It's not big for a lot. It's monster, it's just a creature living where it shouldn't be. Eric? You've read Rex Gilroy, it's mysterious. Oh, I've read Rex Gilroy. The heroic Rex Gilroy is. Thrilling escapades. You know that in his section on, on um, uh, Australian history cats, yeah. he, um, he reproduces several cats where people say that the uh, Australian big cats, history cattle cannibals, they say, had protruding big plus quantity. And he reports cases where people see jellies crouch young in like, Australian big cats. Obviously, he uses this as a the idea they aren't far the this is Rex Gilroy. Now, if it's coming from someone else, I'll be more inclined to give him credit. Rex Gilroy is, he calls himself, this is his, his own moniker that he's given himself, the Australian Charles Court. This is a guy who thinks the ancient Egyptians got to Australia and put the pyramids there. There are UFO bases under the Blue Mountains. There are surviving dinosaurs roaming all over Australia and just about everything. Oh, uh, Gigantopithecus, which is a a giant bamboo feeding ape from the Pleistocene epoch uh, of Asia, which may or may not be the Yeti. There's a, uh, an argument to be made that this thing is still around is the Yeti in Asia. He reckons that was living in Australia as well. Quite how it got there, I don't know. He's swimming or building itself a boat. But he, he also, yeah, that, 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 people think that um, Gigantopithecus was around eight to ten feet tall. He used to say that it's twenty feet tall, or what King Kong is roaming around. The Australian bush with all these giant monster people, big cats and dinosaurs and flying saucers. So, um, when Rex Gilroy says he's, people have reported seeing uh, monster people, big cats with book teeth, I'm inclined not to believe that. Could you just summarise some of the differences in witnesses in non Western cultures? I mean, we obviously, a lot of us are very uh, familiar with having witness reports in our country and Western culture. Presumably in non-Western cultures, I don't have to give you there's issues like cultural taboos, there's issues like the pecking order in society, a demand and elder, or whatever, they don't have so much status, and so many people may not have confidence. No one's ever asked me that before, it's a really intelligent question. Yeah. And social um, scientists. <laughs> the main thing is that in these places, <coughs> there are still big, dangerous animals that can kill you. And people live alongside them. And they get to know them. They have to in order to survive. So when someone tells you they've seen something that is not X, Y, and Z, it's not an own animal, it's something completely different, then you have to wake up and, 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 and take a look up at what they're saying. Um, at one time, Western uh, cultures, Western colonists used to dismiss everything that uh, native people say as a sort of uh, mumbo jumbo of savages. And then it sort of swung back the other way that uh, sort of native people were like great gurus who had to everything. And I think else it's somewhere in between. 
Um, there's lots of examples of this. There's, uh, there's a snake in Somalia that the locals call the Apris, and they think it's so dangerous, it's so deadly poisonous, you've only got to touch it, and like a medieval salamander, you'll collapse down dead from the poison, just have to bite you, and probably just see scales, it's so beautiful. It's actually, it's on a sand it's completely harmless, so they're, they're utterly wrong in that. But it can go the other way. It, in the jungles of Central Africa, there's something called the Hero Shrew. Um, local people say it's an incredibly strong animal. It's a tiny little thing, shrew like that. Uh, a grown man that's on a job and could stand on it, put all his weight on it, and then just carry on unscathed. Sounds like nonsense. But it's true, it's got this little mesh like network of bone from its uh, spine all across its ribs. And no one knows quite why it has this. There's lots of other small animals, closely related, other species of shrew that don't have this. Why the hero shrew has it, we don't know. But it exists, it does have this seemingly mystical power. Uh, the giant monkey tree flock from Peru, the locals said that it has magical secretions, and if you eat them, the secretions, that is, if you tell these secretions, you will become invisible in the forest, and you'll need neither food nor water, and the animals won't be able to see you. When chemists, biochemists, started to look at the secretions of this frog, they found out it negated hunger, thirst, and pain, but it also masked human smell. And most forest animals go by smell rather than sight. So it is, in effect, making you invisible in the forest. Not visually visible, but invisible to animals that use smell. I think we've got time for one more. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you, man. Oh, the Yowie, supposed to be the, the Yowie of Australia. Yeah, we let the Yowie. Yowie. Yeah, no, Yowie is something I think is, is a viable thing. I think so many people have seen the Yowie, there's got to be something behind it. And it's been seen repeatedly and it's still being seen. Uh, I'm inclined to believe it's uh, a very, very primitive human rather than a, a bit like the Almasty of. Um, of Asia, quite how it got over there, I don't know. Maybe at one time they were intelligent enough to build rafts to get over there. Maybe they were brought over by accident, and they've done, they've sort of devolved into a more degenerate bestial form. I don't know, but uh, they're certainly there where they are. Like the Bigfoot, kind of. Yeah, but sure. not like Gigantopithecus. Uh, no, they're not like the Yeti. They're much more human than the Yeti. What sort of locations? Uh, mainly Eastern Australia. That's what the Blue Mountains. I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, we've got an awful lot more stuff to talk to Richard about, and having known him for 48 years, he can talk very well. So I suggest you try and buy him a cup of tea. Buy him a cup of tea and go to the lunch <coughs> and ask him any more questions you've got for him. Uh, I'm, so I'm doing my best to try to keep him. Over the years, I'm always well late, and I want to see if just for once we can take the time. Just so I can fulfill one of my long standing personal ambitions. So, Mr. Trim, thank you very much, Nick.